Hi, welcome. Uh, my name's uh, Professor Oaks. I'm the director of the EPICS program, and I'm going to talk to you about the introduction to design, the design one. What we're going to do is we're going to do a series of, of four introductory lectures to try to give you an understanding of, of our EPICS design process, some of the things that you should be thinking about in your design, uh, ways to, to do your design better. What we're going to do um, with these intro lectures, so there's five lectures. You've already been to one. That was like the, the, the first day with the, the intro lecture. This is the second. These next three are a series on, on specifically design. And we're going to start to talk about the design process. The lecture slides will be posted online. Um, and let us know if you, if you have questions or concerns. At the end of this class period, what we're going to do is you should be able to describe the EPICS design process, identify where your project is in the design process, and we're going to talk about the first two stages in, in the EPICS design process, the problem identification and the specification development. Now, design it is uh, taking ideas, identifying needs, developing ideas and producing a solution. There are a lot of different ways to get there. There's not a single correct path to, to get through a, a design process. What we have is, is we have an EPICS process that we have found over, over 21 years that helps students um, identify the right kind of needs and get an effective project delivered to their, their community partner. And that's the, the process that's shown here. So it's broken up into different stages. We're going to start, start at, the, at the very top here uh, with prob project identification. Uh, we identify what the right problem is, which is an important part. Um, develop specifications. What are the requirements for the project? Conceptual design, where we're exploring different kind of ideas. Detailed design, where we actually make it work in, in delivery. Now, once something is delivered, we as an EPICS program also make a commitment to maintain or to, to service projects in, in some way. And it, this is something that for different partners, it takes on, di on different roles. And we'll talk about that. We partner with our, our community members. We, we call them project partners because they are partners. So when one of our projects it is at the end of its lifespan, we do work with them, whether it should be redesigned or, or retired um, and that. Please notice that at the center of, the, of this whole circle are the stakeholders, the people. One of the critical important things in our design process is we understand that we're doing this with people. The people that we're working with have to be involved through, through the entire process. And they're, they're a very important part of the design process. Um, the, 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 the people are important. The, the other word that, that's up in, in the purple little uh, figure is prototypes. When we go and we ask people what they want, they don't always fully understand or they're not always going to uh, tell us everything. So what we've learned over the years and, and other people have is we want to give people things that they can interact with, prototypes. Now, when I say a prototype, I'm, some of you might think of a finished project, something that almost looks like it's completely finished. But I may take something even like just, just a, like a piece of paper and say, okay, I want the partner to hold this. What is it that you're going to do? Um, how are you going to hold it? What is it that things that you're going to do? I'm holding this in my left hand. So if I give a user this and they start talking about how to do it, I said, okay, well, they're, they're left-handed. So I need to think about this for, for a left-handed person or, or if it's a right-handed hand, right -handed person. So there are things that we can do that, it, that even just simple pieces of paper or simple mock-ups, when somebody has something and they're starting to talk about what they're going to do, you get a lot better information. And we're going to talk about techniques to be able to do that over the next few weeks. Now, there are different design processes. So if you, if you pick up four different books on design, they probably got at least four different types of design process um, in there. And there are different types. But all of them have, at, at the fundamental level, you start with a problem identification and you get to a product. 
One of the things I like about th this it, is it shows the, the circular nature. When I showed that earlier version and when I show our process, it, it shows from a beginning to an end. And design is not like that. There's starts and stops. So you're not just going from step one to step two to step three, you're iterating. And kind of like the spiral is we're going through different parts. We may revisit a, a specific part in the design process. If you get to a point you have to revisit something, like you get partway down the, the design process and you realize we have to go back and we have to revise our specifications, for example. That's not a bad thing. That's a natural part of design. So design it is fluid. Now, it, it's fluid and you're going to go back and forth, but we provide that design process as a structure for you to be able to think about how we're doing the, how you're doing the design. And we mean that as, a, as an aid. Now, the design process is described in a design document. So one of the things that you have for homework is I want you to read the design process document. It's, it's a little over 20 pages. Uh, and there are pictures and, and figures in there too, but it describes our design process and the different elements uh, of the design process. If you go to the EPICS website, the, the Purdue website, and you click on design documents, what, you, what comes to is a page that looks like this, and toward the bottom there's something that says EPICS design process. If you click on that, you get a screen of something that looks like this, and it's a PDF of the, of the design process. So you can print it off, and you can read it, or you can read it online. It's important that you read that because we're going to refer to it over the next four weeks. This is also one of the, the fundamental groundings of, of the EPICS design process, so you understand the kinds of things that we expect in the, de, in the design. When you're reading this, want you to try to place your project. Hopefully you've all been placed on a project. Where your project is in, in the design process. Some of you are going to be on a new project, so you say, okay, we're right at the beginning. That This is going to give you an idea on what's ahead. Some of you might be working on a project that's just getting ready to finish. This is going to give you an idea on what um, the steps took place to get there. If you are on a project that's getting ready to finish, you want to get ready because what we're going to ask you is once that project's finished, you're going to get to start a, another project. So reading this is going to give you a nice background. So that's one of the homework. This is the only reading homework that you're, you're going to get through um, this, I believe. Now the EPICS design process, again, we show it linearly where we're, where we're going from the top to the bottom in this. But really, you, you may go to, to a step we may come down, we may have to go back up, there, there's some iteration. The first stage is project identification. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Second phase, is, so once we've got a, an agreement that we understand what problem we're trying to solve, we need to understand how do we know when we're successful solving that problem. And that's defining a requirement. So I have to have a set of requirements. At mid-semester, we're going to go through a design review, mid-semester and end-of-semester. The design reviewers often will ask you what the requirements are. We need to, to have a, a, a complete set of what are the requirements for the project that are measurable so we understand if we've completed these. If, if my design meets all the requirements, all the specifications, we're done and, I, and I'm successful. After we get the requirements, then we do the conceptual design. We start to look at what are our opportunities, um, what, what are different ways to, to actually meet the specifications. And in conceptual design, we're going to take a lot of different ideas and we're going to narrow it down to a single idea that we implement in the detailed design. And then we go through with delivery. Delivery is a, second, a separate stage because what we know is a lot of times we think we're finished. We have the project finished, but we need to do testing. We need to do documentation. We need to make sure that it's ready to deliver out to the partner. I need to make a note here, and, and I'll talk about it later, but we have a process that all projects need to go through to be approved to be delivered. And we do that be, because of liability reasons 
that we have an agreement with our partners and, and with the, the, the Purdue liability people that we have a process before something goes out the door and gets used by the community partner, it goes through some internal processes. They're, they're not real hard, but it's very important that, that each project meets those. By the way, if you do meet those, in addition to be properly covered for liability and things like that, um, your team can get shirts. We have epic shirts that say we made a difference if a project is delivered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the design process. I want you to read it and one of the first things out of the reading is we're going to ask you where your project is in, in the design process. But I want to very specifically go back and we're going to start from the top and, and we're, we're, we're going to go through and, and around the the cycle and talk about each different phase. So the first phase is the project identification. Project identification there, it, you may say, oh, well, the, the partner knows what we're doing. What we're trying to do is make sure that we understand what the need is, that we have a, a reasonable shot at meeting that need. What are the time constraints and what are some of the constraints? So the problem that we want to tackle is um, within our capability, and we believe that, that within an appropriate time that we can deliver it, so we've got an, an agreement with the partner is. At each of these stages, there's something that you're gonna notice here, it, it is a gate. So the gate, the, the intent there is, I know I'm through that stage if I can meet that. And the gate one is continue if I've identified an appropriate project that, that meets a, a compelling need for the community. It's important when we look at this to say, okay, what's the current situation and what do they want to get to? Um, what, what's the preferred state? How are we addressing the, the, the need? We're not looking at, at a solution. Now, I, I'm going to tell you through this process and for the first two stages, I'm going to say we shouldn't know exactly what the, our idea is yet. That, that we haven't done the conceptual design. But it's human nature that as soon as somebody describes a problem in my head, I've got an idea. So I already see how I want to solve the problem. That is okay. You want to take those ideas and you want to set them aside. You want to pull them out because they're useful. Remember what I said with a, with a prototype. I'm going to take my crude little prototype, my little paper here, and here's my idea. Why well, am I show my partner that idea to get them to say, okay, so what you need is something like this. And they say, yeah, yeah, that's something like that. That's fine. And this is one idea, but this may not be the entire idea. So I want to make sure I understand exactly what they need, not the limitations of the project. So we've identified a problem. We've talked about when they need the project. And it's very important with our partners to say, okay, what is it? What is the problem and when would you need a solution? And we need to decide if, if it's realistic that we can deliver within that, within that time. So once we've got a problem defined, we need to say, okay, how do we know when the problem's going to be solved? What are the requirements? Ultimately, what I want is a, is a set of requirements that are all measurable that I can measure them and I can say, okay, I've measured those and I meet those needs. That's what we're trying to get to. Now, there are a number of different things that we can do within this specification phase. I know we, have, we still have projects out there that when I say, okay, where's your specifications? They list it at a kind of an attributes from the problem identification and say, well, here's what the problem, what the, the project partner needed. Here's what they said they wanted. What I want to do is I want to look at a set of requirements as what does my design need to do. Now when I do this, I need to fully understand what are the needs of the partner because they're going to ask me for certain requirements. But a good designer, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to use my, my eyes and ears and I'm going to identify some other things that might be useful to them. And I might tell them, I said, oh, you know, when I see how you're operating, if the design did this, would it be a benefit? And they may say, oh, that's a great idea. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Or I didn't know you could do that. That's the value that you add as a designer. 
See, we're trying to do a couple things in Epics. We're trying to meet the needs of our partners, but we're also trying to make you a better professional. So when you go out, you can add value to other people that you work with. Anybody can take a set of, of here requirements, I'm gonna go deliver a product. In today's global market, what, what the difference often between a product being successful and not is the ability of people to identify what are those things that nobody else asked for that we figured out that, that the user's gonna need. Now, one of the great ways to understand our partner and a benefit of the kind of partners we have is you're gonna learn a little about um, other people who are working to make the world a better place. All of our partners are in some way working with people of need or trying to meet some environmental human community need. So you wanna learn about them. You wanna learn about them because as a designer, you're gonna be more effective. It's, it's also interesting as you become a global citizen on what do some of these groups do. And it's very important that you spend time with your partner. So early on in a semester, I hope that you're finding an opportunity where you can spend time with partner, not just having a, a meeting and saying, okay, what do you need done? But what do they do? Can you go hang out with them? If, if it's at a school, is there a way to volunteer and you do an activity with some of the kids to learn a little bit more? I know when I used to advise a Habitat for Humanity team, uh, they used to spend a, a full Saturday or Saturday morning out at a work site. And it, it made the designers better, that they had a better appreciation for what Habitat did. It also meant that the, our partner returned our calls faster. So you wanna spend time with them and understand. When you're looking at a partner and you start to, to try to understand, also look at who the stakeholders are. So many of you have a, a single point of contact with your, your organization. And we've, we've trained you to be good students. You, your, your parents have trained you well. You've got an adult, they tell you what to do, or a teacher, and you listen to them. Well, as a designer, I wanna take that person, I wanna listen to them, but I also wanna get other input. I, I wanna see who, who else might be impacted by this and who I need to think about as a designer. So this schematic here shows like for a ticketing system. I gotta think about, okay, who is it that I've gotta interact with? That, that I've got the, the customers who are gonna buy the tickets. I've got the seat reservation system. I, I've got the, the payment system. So if I'm designing a system, I gotta think about all these different kinds of stakeholders. When we're identifying the stakeholders, a challenge we have is, is we would like the stakeholders there to answer questions all the time, but they're not always there all the time. So I can go out and I can do things like I can interview them. That's a great way to get information. I can do observations. Sometimes I can't, I don't have access to them. So what I need to do is I need to make like profiles with them or what we call personas, create scenarios where we can role play uh, with that. It's very important that, that each team has some kind of personas of typical users that you can use. So when you don't have access to the real people, you can say, okay, how would this person, actually look, I'm gonna explain a little bit about the personas. Prototyping at every stage is important. So when we're doing the specifications, it's important to, to look at some crude prototypes. And I'll give you a simple example. Worked with a lot of projects where one of the requirements is something needs to be portable. Well, portable, you really can't measure. So if I say something's portable, I come down, and I said, well, there's probably a size limit. I gotta be able to pick it up. And then there's gonna have to be some kind of weight limit. Well, if somebody says, well, I could ask somebody how much, you know, it could somebody lift? That's gonna be okay. It's much more effective to take something over and say, all right, I've got, and I know my little paper here is not very heavy, but I could take something and say, okay, I want you to lift this. So when we talk about portable, is this the kind of thing? Almost always, if you ask somebody, how much something could weigh to be easily used, they're gonna give you a higher estimate than, than what's actually gonna be useful. So you wanna use things to test. So prototypes early are just mock-up things to say, okay, can you lift this? Is this about the right size? You know, when you're looking at size and weights or, or things like that, early crude prototypes are gonna help you get more accurate answers.
Now let me talk a little bit about the personas. I've already run into even some of my lab sections where they say, well, we can't get to the partner because they're too far away and lab's only two hours and blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's important to get over there, but when we can't, we want to create fictional characters that represent actual real people. Okay, so we want to get some kind of information from the field through observations, uh, interviews, or we talked about people, and we want these to represent the different stakeholders. They're, they're going to uh, represent kind of typical or, or average stakeholders, not individual people. And we want to be very specific, so we want to give names, pictures, and as much details as we can. I'll use an example of, of a team. So the glass team um, had a, a handheld educational augmentative RFID device, HERD. And when they were developing this, they developed a couple personas. So they looked at ty types of stakeholders. And two of the primary stakeholders is they had students and instructors. They, they also had secondary users, and you can use the personas for those. But if I look at just the, the, the primary stakeholders um, up here, they identified two. So they, they did a profile of an instructor. What's an instructor? So if you look here, the age range, 25 to 55. So I'm going to pick here different job titles, and then they pick students. So the range of these people is pretty significant, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a typical one. So here's a teacher within the age range. Notice that they've given this person a name. Uh, where they work, they've given them as much details. What this does is when I'm testing and I come in, I say, okay, you, one of your teammates, you're going to be Mrs. Brown. Put yourself in Mrs. Brown's situation. Okay, so how are you going to react? Or we can all as a design team to say, okay, how would somebody like Mrs. Brown react to this? And I can do the same thing with a student. We give the student a name. Again, we we pick them in a the range. Now with this one, what I, what you might do is say, wow, we've got younger students and older. So maybe we pick a couple students. But having these personas out there, they're, they're not large. But taking time to do this gives us a tool as a design team to, to help us think about what the stakeholders are, are going to use. These are not a substitute for time out with the, the user. But from a practical standpoint, when I don't have access to them all the time, this is a really important way to bring their insights into the, into the classroom. And what we can do also is we can create scenarios that these people may have to go through. So these scenarios are things that when we start to get our concepts in, in conceptual design, remember at this point we're still doing requirements. So we're doing these personas to help us think about what are the requirements. But these scenarios are, okay, here's how some of the people are going to interact and can we role play through this as we test things. Um, as I noted before, these are great tools, but they're not a replacement for getting real feedback. They're at a time when, when it's not convenient for me to get uh, feedback for these. Now, prototypes are something that, that are very, very important. I mentioned them before. We're going to use them as feedback. There, and there are two types of prototypes. One type is a proof of concept. Can I get the technology to work? When we get down to conceptual design, we may be doing some of those. Those are the kinds of things you'd see out on the, on the bench top or something like that. That's important. Another type of prototype and, and the stuff that we're going to talk about here, they're communication devices. How do I get my user to tell me more? You know, I, I did mention that the, the rolled up piece of paper is a useful thing. We did have a team that delivered something to a partner and they delivered it for somebody that was right-handed and the partner was actually left-handed. So my highly sophisticated rolled up piece of paper, if they'd gone and said, okay, just put this in your hand and talk about what you're going to do, they would have seen left-handed and they wouldn't have had to return the project and redesign it. So prototypes can, can be sketches, especially on software and things. I might say, okay, here I've got, I've got a sketch here. This is what it's going to do. You're going to hit a button. And after you hit this button, then you're going to go to an, another um, piece. They can be quick mock-ups. Uh, the, the, some of the leading design firms will, will take tape and, and post-its and cardboard and scissors out in the field when they're working with users and say, okay, this is the kind of thing that you're talking about. And they'll mock something up and say, okay, so is this kind of the right size? 
it's real important. When we look at prototypes too, this is an, so this is a, a real live example from IDO. IDO is one of the um, world's most prestigious design firms. They, they designed the, the first mouse on the computer that I'm using uh, for, for this. Actually, they designed the first mouse for Apple uh, for a computer. They, they've done all kinds of incredible designs. The, the, the picture here, the, the thing on the far edge of the screen, it, it's a medical instrument that, that's used in nasal surgery. So it's a very sophisticated thing. The first prototype that they used when they showed that the, the, their partner, their customer, is, is, is this thing that's mocked up with a, the marker, a clothespin, and, and a, a little container. That little container, by the way, used to have film. Back before we had digital pictures, we put film in little canisters, but anyway, um, I, that kind of thing. Put together in a matter of, of minutes, but that kind of thing actually changed uh, the, the type of design that they were doing. So this is the kind of thing that we do in the lab. There's all kinds of raw materials if you need more uh, tape, foam, cardboard, that kind of stuff. Ask your TA or advisor. We, we can get you plenty of that. When you're doing a prototype and, and you're interacting, this is a kind of thing. It's just like a little four by four matrix. It shows what worked with the prototype, what could be improved, questions I have, other ideas. So when you're interacting with the user, you want to take notes. This can be in a, in a physical notebook or you can take it digitally. Now we're doing all these things to try to get a set of requirements. And a set of requirements are, they have to be quantified. They can be measurable and they can be tested. They're objective, they're based on some metric. Now when I say this is it, they're objective, when I work for Procter & Gamble, they make consumer products. So one of the things might be the consumer had a good experience or it tasted good. Well, what they would do is to say, okay, I'm gonna pick a, 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 a random panel and I want you know uh, eight out of 10 to, to rate this positively. That's a quantifiable type thing. That's a way to test. So even if I have something that seems like it's subjective, I can do some type of testing. You need some type of units. The reason we need these measurable and testable is I need to be able to understand have I met them or not. A great way to, I'll give, sorry, I'll give you some examples of, of some of these. So one of the devices, um, a, a device for a communication device, when they started with this, they started with, okay, the requirement is got to play sounds with different kinds of cards. Well, if I break that in is, okay, I've got to record and store sounds. And then I've got to be able to uniquely identify the cards. Well, now when I come in, if I've got to record the sounds, I need to think about it to say, okay, how long are the messages? What are the memory requirements? The number of messages. And that last column, way over here, oops, way over here, actually has the specifications. So my specifications are, I need messages that last five seconds. Each one, and I've got a, a, a amount there. There's 128K of memory, and it needs to store 15 messages. When I look at, at uniquely identifying cards, I need to be able to identify 16 cards. Um, I, I need to be able to, to place or remove cards, and the so sound needs to be connected. So that's a set of requirements that the thing needs to do that I can measure. You want to take these requirements and you want to make sure that your partner, your, your project partner agrees to those. Now, at this point, I've done some prototyping, I've shown them, so I've got some ideas in my head already what this thing looks like. That's okay, that's okay. We, we've used these to get to the requirements. If your project does not have a set of requirements that you know about, take time to actually put these down and write down what is it that they have to do. It's also important when we're doing these, I've got a set of requirements. I want to then look at what's currently available out in the marketplace. And I want to do this for a couple reasons. One, I don't want to, I, I want to go out and see what's patented, what's already in the market. I don't want to infringe on anybody. I don't want to violate anybody's patent. I also want to know if there's something out there. We have had partners that have gone through and they've identified the project, they've identified requirements, they've looked at current projects. Just last year, we had a team that came and said, we can find, and I can't remember the amount, it was like $40 or 
we can buy exactly what the partner needs. What should we do? The answer is easy. Buy it. Buy it, give it to the partner. That meets the need. You, you've, you've met that need. I said, what do we do the rest of the semester? We go back to project identification and we identify the next need. There are too many needs for our partners. If we can meet one with something that's commercially available, let's point them to that, call that a success, and then let's move on to something that they can't get right now. Those are the kinds of problems that I want you all working on. Now we also got into a discussion on whether that counted as a delivery and whether they got the shirts. That's a, a whole different conversation. Actually, yes, we did give them the shirts, we celebrated that, and they started another project. Now when I'm doing the requirements, a great way to organize them is just a simple table. I've got my requirements, they're on the far left hand side. The origin, where did they come from? Some of your projects are carrying requirements that was somebody's idea and it's not real not a, a hard and fast rule and now they're trying to meet that requirement and you're spending a lot of time and money and effort and, and it's, it, it's really not needed. Or you may not be able to meet a requirement fully. Say maybe we can meet at 80%, is that enough? I need to understand where it came from so I can go back to the source to see if that's actually gonna go. You want to look at how will you know if you've achieved it? What is the success requirement? And then the last column is if, if it's been completed. A successful design has met all these requirements and everything's completed. That's how you know when you're done. And it's, it's a very simple way and this document should exist for every project. And here's an example. So I've got uh, uh, sound is audible in a classroom. That's my spec. The origin came from a community partner requirement and we're actually gonna do a test in the classroom. Project should be educational. That's a partner requirement. We're gonna do a pre and post test. We might do an interview with the students. Some other examples, if you look at, um, uh, from one of the things, you've got different things. The output range of voltage needs to be Here's specific. Power supply for less subs subsystems for at least 12 hours at the level of performance. So I've got a battery life, I've got things that, that are quantified. Mechanical arm reached at a minimum distance of two feet from the rover. It's a quantifiable um, thing. Collision avoidance must prohibit museum guests from driving a rover into an object. Okay, I can test these things. I can tell, I can do a test, I can say, okay, does it meet these requirements? Every project should have um, these. The goal at this point is to understand what is needed, not how. Now remember, even my simple little prototypes, my little ideas, I'm already thinking about how. That's okay, but my focus is on what? I'm gonna deal with how in the next conceptual design. But at this page, you have completed conceptual design if your partner and advisor both agree that you've identified the right need. There are no existing commercial products that are affordable. A lot of the work we do, they're, they're commercially available things, but they're too expensive. So there's not something already out there, and I have a list of requirements of what the need is. Then you pass the specification phase. So here's what I would like you to do. I want you to read the design document um, paper, okay, that we've got up on the website and, and I showed you where that is. And I want you to ask, if you're, if you're, well, you're viewing this online, you're gonna go into my epics and you're, you're going to answer the questions. It says, what three things did you learn? Here's how I want you to format those. The first thing, is where is your current project in the design process, in the EPICS design process. The second question is I want you to look at the, the first phase. How well did your team, are you capturing or did you capture the pro project identification? Is there evidence there in the documentation if your project's ongoing that they captured the need? What is the need? And the second thing is I want you to assess the state of your specifications. Now, if you're on a brand new project, you're just writing these, 
And so you're going to say, um, here's how we're going to write the specifications. Okay, so you're going to look at where your project is. You're going to reflect on the first two phases of, of the design process. We're going to go through the last, um, uh, continue on conceptual design when we get into generating ideas and, and how we select those in the last piece. Thank you very much. Good luck on your projects. We're excited about this semester.